Story 1. Me and my sister emailed the adoption agency that mom was applying through to foster a child, telling them how she'd treated us as kids, resulting in her being denied. She'd end us if she found out, but definitely saved some kid, so don't regret it. I did this with my dad. He called me up one day randomly asking for my email address and my full address so a fostering agency could contact me. This was the first I knew about it, and I said, well, this is news to me, how come you didn't say sooner? He instantly went, You've known for ages, what's your problem? So I just shut up and told him. Over two weeks, I tried to talk to him about how me and my siblings were treated, to see if there was any remorse or if he had learned from it, as I don't speak to him very often. He said we deserved everything we got. I already knew I was going to tell the agency the truth, but that just really did it. So when I got the agency call, I told them everything. I told them not to do it. I'd hate for a child who's already going through hell to be put with someone like him and his girlfriend. Well, two days later, he called me screaming, asking me why I lied about being smacked and hit as a child, and screamed about how I ruined his and his girlfriend's lives, and then promptly disowned me. Small price to pay to save other kids from even more trauma. Story 2. That I almost died. I got sick, bad, and it kept getting worse. I told them it was a cold, knowing they would drop everything to come check on me, potentially disrupting their own lives. I bought plane tickets for them the day after my operation, pretty much knowing I wouldn't survive. The hospital staff saved my life, and now every year on the anniversary, I make it a point to send them flowers. The only one who knows is my wife. I don't necessarily blame you, and I am so happy you survived. However, disrupting your humdrum life to be by your child's side in a time of need is literally what good parents want to do. It wouldn't be taking them away from their purpose in life, which is not their day job or weekly grocery trips. It would be fulfilling their purpose in life, which is you. Unless they would have disrupted their lives into straight poverty just to take care of you, which would still have been their choice, you probably suffered alone unnecessarily. That's kind of what being a good parent means. Story 3. My mom hooked sometimes when we didn't have enough money. My parents got divorced when I was 3, and then got remarried when I was 10. After they got divorced, dad got sent overseas for 3 years, and then we moved back to my mother's hometown. This was in the early 70s, and we lived in Section 8 apartments, and my older brother's father from her previous marriage didn't pay any child support. My dad paid as much child support as he could afford, but before Reagan, a senior airman didn't make anywhere near enough to support the three of us living apart from him. Even when they were together, he had to work a part-time job just to make ends meet. So, while they remained divorced, we had very little money, and sometimes by the last of the month, the cupboards would be bare, unless mom was able to do some sewing for a friend of hers. She also would go out on Friday night and leave us with my aunt, and then we would go grocery shopping the next day, despite being told two days before that we didn't have enough money to go shopping. I was too young to know what was actually going on at the time, but when I was in my early 20s, I finally put two and two together, and I realized that she had been part-time hooking to make ends meet. I know my dad didn't know about it, and I never let my mom know that I knew what she had to do for us. Story 4. The real reason my wife and I are divorcing is because we can't stop doing drugs together. We've been enabling each other for about two years and doing the drugs to the point that they really became the only thing we had in common. We tried to get clean and did well for six months before relapsing at a friend's party a couple of weekends ago. She blamed me and left with her kids two days later with no warning. It's the hardest thing I've ever gone through, and my parents have no idea why it happened. I got into therapy, and I am determined to stay sober this time, forever. But I think it's too late for our marriage. Story 5. I downloaded dozens of movies I would never be allowed to watch using the church's Wi-Fi. I download them, watch them late at night, delete them, and find the next movie. This is how I watched the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit trilogy, and all of the Harry Potter movies for the first time since I was a toddler. Looking back, it's one of the more mild things I did as a teen but it would be the worst thing in my mom's mind. The repercussions of knowing I lost my virginity at 14 weren't nearly as bad as it would have been if she knew I had been downloading movies like Gladiator or Kingdom of Heaven and using the church's internet. Oh boy, if only she knew that's how I watched the Alien movies for the first time.
Story 6. Senior year of high school. My parents were going out of town one weekend and didn't trust me home alone, so I stayed with my aunt and uncle a few towns over. My friend drove me to school that morning, and he was telling me about this girl he was trying to hook up with. I told him my parents would be out of town and that I'd leave him my spare key. He could have a couple people over, but I made him promise no more than ten, and nobody leaves the basement. Fast forward to later that night, I'm walking my aunt and uncle's dog. Somebody texted me asking if they could come over. I told them I'm not home and to talk to my friend. Couple minutes later, the same thing from someone else. Couple minutes later, someone from another school asked if they could come to my party. That's when I first realized I should call my friend and see what's up. The small kickback turned into a full-blown rager. Apparently, one of the guys he invited ended up inviting the whole soccer team, and then it just grew from there. It was all anyone talked about for a while at school. Neighbors knocked, cops drove by. Best party of the year from what I heard. Most of the people that showed up didn't even know that I wasn't there. Next day, my friend and another friend came back to clean up and they heard someone upstairs. It was my mom's friend coming by to feed the cat. They hid in a closet for a bit until it was clear. Despite all that, to this day, my parents somehow have no idea any of this happened. I was on edge about it for months after the fact. The part I've always found funniest or most ironic is the fact that if they had left me home alone that weekend, then none of this would have happened. We're 26 now. He's still my best friend. If I remember correctly, he did end up hooking up with that girl that night. The cat was safe. He lives with me now. I still give him crap about this. Story 7. For the record, this happened while I was an adult. I walked upstairs one morning to discover my dad pleasuring himself in the living room. Apparently, he hadn't heard me walk up the stairs. So I went the other direction and loudly opened the medicine cabinet and even dropped a bottle of Tylenol on purpose to alert him that someone else was awake. When I walked back towards the living room and kitchen, his pants were zipped and he was nonchalantly checking the news on his tablet instead of probably looking at adult films. I pretended that I hadn't seen anything. Honestly, it's not that big of a deal that he pleasure himself in general, but he could have at least done it in his office with the door closed. Not in the living room, where there are no doors and it's attached to the kitchen. Story 8. I found my mom's diary from when she was in high school. In it, she talks about her infatuation with a classmate named Roman. Roman was, just based on the way she describes him, the biggest F-boy in the world. He was a total douche. He would not commit to my mom, but he would flirt with her just enough to lead her on. At one point, she did his homework for him. I swear if I had access to a time machine for just five minutes, I would use it exclusively to reach back in time and slap my mom repeatedly for being such a sucker for this douchebag. Now, here's the worst part. My dad's name is Roman. He went to the same high school as my mom. But my dad is the kindest, most generous, and decent guy I know. Roman is not that common a name, but I'm trying to convince myself she's talking about another Roman because the guy she's describing could not be my dad. Story 9. Well, they're both gone, so I can say it now. I hated the way I was forced to look after them. Then, on top of that, I was bullied and teased and tortured at school, and they didn't even care about that. As long as I was there to do everything, that's all they cared about. I felt unloved. Then, after I grew up, my mom decided she just wasn't going to do anything anymore, and she didn't. I hated all of that. They were the parents, not me. Then they explained it by saying that that's the way it is, and everyone does this. Now, I have a brother and a sister who are on disability. In the future, I won't be doing what I did before. Sorry for the rant, but I had to get that out. Story 10. The full extent of my criminal activity from ages 16 to 28. I never got caught, and I never really hurt anyone, but I was a troubled youth and young adult that struggled both with money and mental health issues, so I lashed out. Not my mom's fault at all, and it would kill her to know everything. She knows I wasn't squeaky clean since my teen years. Hell, I'm not squeaky clean now, but I have a career and apartment and cars and credit. It took a long time to get here, though. Sometimes I tell her about some of the smaller stuff early on, and she's just glad I'm not doing that stuff anymore. Story 11. My wife and I decided to give our second child up for adoption when we found out he had hypoplastic left heart syndrome. 
There was just no way that we could provide the resources to give him the best possible chance in life. We found a great family that couldn't have children and did all the legal stuff. We had to tell my parents that my wife was pregnant and that we weren't keeping it, all in one conversation, which broke my mom's heart. I think it was because it was going to be a boy, so he would carry on the family name. I think this is archaic. Plus, we aren't royalty or famous. I don't know. Later in the pregnancy, my wife's doctor told us that there is a good chance that any future child we have will also have HLHS, which makes our daughter a miracle. So, my wife and I discussed more permanent birth control methods and decided that a vasectomy would be the best option. I think that was around two years ago that I got the procedure done. I don't know that I will never tell them, but I don't have any plans to. Story 12. My mom has never been intelligent. My sister and I think she is around 6th grade level mentality, and I couldn't really tell growing up because we were homeschooled and isolated and neglected until high school. So we didn't see much of what a normal mom was like until we were well into adulthood. She can't comprehend complex conversations, and I find myself dumbing down what I say to her so she can understand. She doesn't know how to have an original thought and just copies other people's exact words and comment sections on social media. Over the last several years, I've been distancing myself because I hold a grudge over my childhood being traumatic and my mom never being there for me or being helpful in any way. She's self-centered and emotionally immature, and it's exhausting being around her. Story 13. My mom takes me on vacation to the Caribbean area sometimes. We stay at resorts, around once every one to two years. We went at the end of last year, and I realized I was only really enjoying myself when I wasn't around her. She wants to spend almost all waking hours together. When she's drunk, she makes baseless assumptions and doesn't accept the possibility that they could be, and are, wrong. So, on the days that she got drunk, I'd make sure she got in bed safely and go out and actually have fun. She asked me for destinations that I'd like to go to, and I just told her that I don't think I want to travel for now. The truth is that I don't want to travel with her. Story 14. That my wife and I had an abortion last year. Also, to add to the parents, I know that my wife secretly resents me for suggesting the decision to abort. I know that my wife secretly resents me for suggesting the decision to abort. I know that she does, and tries to hide the fact that she does, which is both expected and soul-crushing for me at the same time. I know that it was a practical decision, because we couldn't afford to take care of a child at this point in our lives, but it doesn't mean that I don't question it sometimes. I'm secretly depressed and worried that I'm slowly losing her. Talk to her if you haven't already about how you feel, including questioning your decision. It was a decision you both made together based on values. The outcome won't change, but sometimes recognizing the values behind the decision can help with understanding. It's easier to blame someone than to accept that you both came to that decision together. I hope it works out for you both, and that the guilt can be accompanied by understanding and love. Story 15. That my soon-to-be ex-husband put his hands on me. They live halfway around the world. About nine months ago, my soon-to-be ex-husband backed me into a corner of our now former kitchen, spewing utter vitriol in my face. His hands flew toward my face and neck. This wasn't the first time he'd been aggressive. He had a history of throwing things, and on several occasions I sustained injuries from those incidents. However, this kitchen incident was the first time I genuinely feared for my safety. Later that day, while he was out of the house, I found myself on the phone with a DV agency in my state. They effectively shut the door in my face and told me I earned too much money to qualify for any help. I wasn't even asking for money. I just didn't feel safe at home. I did the next best thing I could think of in that moment of fear and texted my father. I simply told him that my husband's anger had reached an untenable level that day, and I needed to get out of the house that same day. Within six to eight hours, I was boarding an aircraft bound for 1,000 plus miles away, with nothing but the clothes on my back and one small carry-on suitcase. Funny how history repeats itself. Fifty-ish years ago, my mother and her family fled their war-torn country due to the religious persecution with nothing but the clothes on their back and one bag per person in search of a better and safer life for themselves. I never in a zillion years imagined I'd ever find myself following in her footsteps, quite literally. I don't ever plan to tell them the specifics about that incident in the kitchen. 
they'd be horrified if they knew. Story 16. When I was in the 11th grade, I skipped school, told my parents there was a field trip, and went to hang out with a boy I liked. Well, my mom was friends with the secretary, and she called once she got the call that I was absent. Turns out, the field trip has been cancelled. I knew she would overreact if I told her I skipped to go to a boy's house, even if the most we did was cuddle, play video games, and eat pizza rolls. So, I told them I thought there was a field trip and I was late getting to school. The field trip was supposed to be to a college across the street, so I told them I went there to look for them, searched the whole campus, couldn't find them, and by then it was too late to go to school. Anyways, the guy who I hung out with has now been my boyfriend for about four years, and I refuse to tell my parents anything about it. I've learned by now that even if I think something is okay to talk about, it doesn't mean they won't get on my case if I tell them, even if it was four years ago. Story 17 the true extent of my mental health issues. My dad left my mom when I was young and has been exploitive alcoholic the majority of his life. He hasn't spoken to me in about two years, and I don't want him to. He's the most manipulative person I know. My mom busted her butt for us kids to have a decent life, but she's incredibly emotionally distant. I know she loved us, but she never had time for us. I took on a lot of responsibility as a kid and young teen to help any way I could watching siblings, getting the best grades, never going out or seeing friends, etc. I'm realizing now how stressful my childhood was. I have a slew of mental health problems and addictions at 19. I feel like I can help anyone, but never myself. I have horrible anxiety and paranoia, which makes me wonder if I could ever hold down a job and be a real person. My mom doesn't understand mental health. She thinks most people are just faking or aren't trying hard enough so I'll never tell her. Story 18. When I was in nursing school, I was positive I had failed my psychology final. I was super bummed because failing meant retaking the class. I wanted to cheer myself up and wound up at a local pet shop. I also wound up coming home with a puppy. I was still living with my parents. I didn't think it through, and instead of admitting not only did I buy a puppy without asking, I did it because I'm positive I just failed a class. So, I said I found him in the parking lot and would have felt too guilty to not bring him home with me. He became Leroy from the streets Jenkins. To this day, 12 years later, my parents still have no clue I really bought him. Also, I passed the final, and the class. Story 19. That I will never go back home. I moved to another country and felt, and still feel sometimes, so homesick. There wasn't a day I wouldn't think about them and my siblings but they just didn't care about me. My mom started doing a lot of stuff that was unlike her until they divorced. Then she started dating someone my age and being terrible with my sister. Besides the fact she's a narcissist, it didn't take long to realize they didn't care about me at all. They just care about me if they want money. When I first moved out, I couldn't wait to go back. But now, I don't even want to go near home. I feel I have no home, and I also don't feel home in my new country even though I'm engaged to someone amazing. Definitely not his fault. They think I'll go visit sometime soon, but I'm planning on not going at all.